Good morning. I, I guess when the music stopped, that's, that's time for me to come up. So. <laughs> Welcome. We're glad that you are here this morning. Welcome. I'm glad that you, you folks are here with us this morning. and Thank you for joining us. And, uh, and for those of you at home watching or wherever you may be watching, we are glad that you have uh, tuned in with us this morning as well. And uh, we are to... It's an interesting time to be the church as we gather in person and as we gather in our homes or wherever we may be, but we are still, still the church. So let's, uh, let's pray this morning. Lord, we thank you as we can come and we can gather, whether in person or whether over the internet, through Facebook, however it might be. Father, we have come on this Sabbath to worship you. Lord, to, to bow before you, Lord, to, to lift this day up before you. So we give it to you. Father, we give this service to you. We put it into your hands. Lord, we pray that it be honoring and glorifying to you. And so we lift this time up to you. In your son's precious name we pray. Amen. All right. Well, the, uh, the Edwards are recovering uh, slowly but surely. Uh, from uh, talking with uh, Pastor Tracy, and I got to uh, lay, lay eyes on him on Thursday uh, from a distance, of course, but I uh, dropped a puzzle off and some goodies to them, but uh, uh, they're, they're looking good, and uh, uh, I know Cindy and Grace, I believe, are fully, pretty much recovered, and uh, I know Tracy's getting there. He kind of took a little bit of a dip uh, over, I think, Friday uh, but was uh, feeling a little bit better yesterday, from what it sounds like. So, uh, and that's when he taped his message was yesterday. So, but keep them in your prayers, and uh, as they uh, fully get back on their feet uh, with it. So, I'm going to jump into some announcements uh, this morning. If you want to follow along in your bulletin, you're more than welcome to, and you should be getting them at home as well through your email. Uh, if you are not. Please uh, let us know here at the church office, and we will add you uh, to our email list and make sure that you do get those. Uh, Wednesday night, so for right now, the youth group is not meeting, but but uh, we have set a date for February 3rd. So not this, this Wednesday, but the following Wednesday, uh, the goal is that we will start meeting in person again uh, with the youth group. Uh, if at all possible, weather permitting, we would... Uh, like to maybe start outside some way, some shape, some form. Uh, we will see how that goes and what it looks like uh, from talking and meeting with the youth one-on-one -on -one or in small groups. Most of them, uh, those who did, we just had a few couple who did have COVID are recovered or recovering. Uh, and most of the others who were in quarantine are now out. And so everything is looking good and, uh, and safe for them, so keep them in your prayers, and hopefully in two weeks we can be back together again. So uh, February 3rd is our target date for the youth group to start meeting, but until then, we are uh, continuing to try to meet up with them one-on-one -on -one or in small little cluster groups, and uh, we're kind of uh, we're dropping off Bible study books that we're, we're going through and we'll be going through uh, with them as well. And adult Bible study is up and running on Wednesday nights through Zoom, via Zoom, at 6.30 on Wednesday nights. And they're studying the book of Acts. And you should be getting in your email an invitation for that as well as questions. And again, once again, if you are not getting those in your email and would like to, let us know here and we will add you to the list and make sure that you do get those. And that is the adult Bible study. Uh, men's retreat, as of right now, is still on for February 19th through the 21st at Fall, Fall Creek Falls State Park. And uh, they, will, they will be camping uh, in Area E. So if you want to reserve your spot, you can uh, actually reserve it through Fall Creek Falls and, uh, and join the men for that. And that is really it for announcements, unless I am missing anything. Uh, I do know, uh, Pastor Tracy did communicate to me yesterday, that the uh, Marriage Matters um, is going to be put on hold for right now. Uh, it sounds like um, just people are kind of 
kind of zoomed out at the moment. And so they're going to uh, kind of regroup and take a look at that. And probably there's, we're just going to postpone it for the moment, but we will continue on with it. Uh, but uh, we'll try to gather, gather a few more people for it before we, we do it again. So just so you know that. And that is really it for announcements. And um, so if you want to join me for the call to worship, if you would stand, please. Behold, how good and pleasant it is for brothers to dwell in unity. God favors those who pursue peace and blesses them. may be seated. According to my Fitbit, I put on half a mile just playing that one little song right there. That's, that's a lot of strumming. If, we'll, uh, if you'll join me with the prayers of the people this morning, and I will lead off, and, uh, and then at one point I will go silent, and that's when we lift up those that maybe God has put onto our hearts and minds uh, this, this day, this week, this year. And lift them up before God. So join me in prayer. Lord, again, we, we, we come to you on this beautiful Sabbath day that you have given us. Father, as we, as we gather as your church, Lord, as we lift this day to you. We thank you, Lord, that as we, seems like as we're speeding into 2021, so much uh, is happening so soon. And yet, Father, we know that you are still on the throne, Lord. You hold it all in your hands, and we trust you in that, and we know that you have us. Lord, we thank you again that uh, every day, every week, your word, oh, it continues to go out, day in and day out, every week, every weekend, every Sunday. Father, all over this great big world, Father, we lift up those who, who proclaim your name. Father, we lift up those churches around this world that, 
that lift up your name. Lord, we, we think of churches that, that have to do it even in secret, Father, who have to do it um, at great risk. Lord, we ask your hand of protection upon those who, who are in danger just by proclaiming your name. And yet, Father, we know that in areas like that, people are still coming to know you each and every day. And we thank you for that. And Father, again, we thank you for the churches right here in our own area, here in Chattanooga and Hickson. Father, we think of the churches around us right now, right down the street from us who are meeting. Father, we lift up those pastors who are getting ready to bring forth your word this moment. Father, we pray that their words would be your words. Be with those congregations. Father, you have... uh, You have told us, you have commanded us to bring our anxiousness before you, Father, to bring our worries, to bring our concerns before you. Lord, you've told us to bring the prayers for others before you. Father, you have put people and situations into our hearts and into our minds. And sometimes we don't even know why. But, Lord, they're there for a reason. So, Father, now, as we lift them up to you, hear our prayers. Lord, we think of those who, are, who have been shut in for a long time now. <clears throat> they have patiently waited. Father, we pray for more patience. Lord, I, we pray that for your peace that goes beyond all understanding upon them. Be with them. Lord, as we move closer and closer to a little bit of sunlight at the end of a tunnel. Lord, give us patience. Father, we thank you that you are not only a God who hears, but you are a God who acts. So hear our prayers, Lord, we thank you. Now we lift up the rest of this service to you, Lord. We pray that the words that come out of Pastor Tracy's mouth this morning, Lord, would fall upon, would fall upon us, Lord that we would not only hear them, Lord, but we would be able to act upon them. So we lift the rest of this time up to you, Father. We put it into your hands. Pray in your Son's name. Amen. If you would join me now in the prayer that our Father taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, how will it be thy name? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Give us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. of God has reached for me and pulled me from a raging sea and I am safe on the solid ground the Lord is my salvation I will strength will help me scale these walls. 
dawn of the rising sun, the Lord is my salvation. Father, we thank you and praise you for the opportunity to come together as brothers and sisters in Christ. Lord, I would ask that the meditations of my heart and the words of my mouth bring honor and glory to you. Lord, we give thanks for this wonderful day we have in front of us. 
And we thank you for the word of God made manifest in your holy scriptures. But more importantly, the word of God made manifest through your son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we just ask that you would be with us this day. In Christ's name, amen. Before I begin, I just want to apologize for my voice uh, as I continue to heal. My voice hasn't completely come back uh, with the coughing and stuff like that. And if I and I cough, I apologize. I'll do my best to try to shoot it away from the, from the computer this time around so it won't be so loud. But <laughs> let's begin. This past Wednesday, our country <clears throat> did something that no other country has done. Once again, for the 46th time over the last 245 years, our nation has peacefully transitioned once more its leadership. Now, I do realize that a couple of weeks ago there was some riots and some people that breached our nation's capital, and I'm not trying to diminish that heightened sense of security that was present this past Wednesday. Because we know that even in our own democracy, there's always going to be people who will feel disenfranchised and even cheated because the results didn't go their way. And unfortunately, throughout the history of our nation, there have been times when those feelings have boiled over and violence has erupted. We know of assassination attempts. We know of a civil war demonstrations, protests throughout the history of our nation, and of course, what we saw just a few short weeks ago. Like I mentioned in last week's sermon, our country is severely divided on many fronts. 2020 and the past few weeks just seemed to bring a focus on a myriad of issues that have added to that increasing chasm of misunderstanding and mistrust it continues to build within our nation. And once again, it seems like we are at a moment when political power swing is once again going to leave close to half our nation feeling exiled, lost, and unrepresented within their own country. But unfortunately, it's nothing new to our nation. It's happened before. I know four years ago, there's an there were a lot of people that were upset when Donald Trump was elected president. There were just as many as, uh, that are upset that he wasn't this time around. As long as there's been democracy, there are always going to be struggles on how to make it work well. So there are always going to be different groups fighting to be heard and recognized, fighting to put their position forward and to gain power. But the tricky part of living within a democracy like this is how do we as Christians help maintain peace and civility as this grand experiment that our forefathers put in motion continues to roll on. Obviously, we have learned anew that our democracy is a powerful and yet a very fragile thing. Last week, I discussed how we need to act in perilous and chaotic times like these. We answered the question of, in the midst of my own anger and frustrations, how am I to act? And we talked about how we need to love one another. I want to continue that discussion from a little bit different vantage point, and it's how do we pursue peace? Because when our nation swings from one political power to another, and it will as long as we're here, as long as it continues to hold together, we have to acknowledge and give space for those who feel that their side lost. And most importantly, we must pursue peaceful means of learning to live with those changes. Because if we don't pursue peace with one another, then the faithful words of Jesus Christ that he said in Luke's gospel, a house divided against itself will fall. We have a very danger of making it come to fruition. God's people are those who are charged to be the pursuers of peace. It's been that way all the way through the Old Testament into the New Testament. It goes out to us 
we are the ones who need to exemplify peace. Even when things don't turn out for our benefit, and especially when those things happen that don't come to our liking. I want to turn to the Old Testament now to give us an idea of, of how it was handled in a very different time. You heard me mention that when political power changes, at least in our country, it does so peacefully or has been. But in many countries, when political power has changed, people are literally put into exile. In our country, thankfully, that hasn't happened often, or to the extreme it does in many countries. But there, many times, is a profound feeling of being exiled within your own country when things don't go your way. So let's take a, a look back at the book of Jeremiah, chapter 29, verses 7 through 13. Excuse me. Listen to Jeremiah's words. I'm going to read them to you, and then I'm going to give you a context of what he was speaking into. And I'll give you a better idea of, of how this fits. Jeremiah 29, verses 7 through 13. Seek the welfare of the city where I sent you into exile, and pray to the Lord on its behalf. For in its welfare you will have welfare. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Do not let your prophets who are in your midst and your diviners deceive you, and do not listen to the dreams which they dream. For they prophesy falsely to you in my name. I have not sent them, declares the Lord. For thus says the Lord, when 70 years have been completed for Babylon, I will visit you and fulfill my good word to you, to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for calamity, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. Those words were spoken by the prophet Jeremiah into the people who were already in exile in Babylon. It's not something that was coming. It's something that they were going through. And these people felt extremely lost. They completely, well, exile literally means they were completely taken out of their country and now are living probably in prison in Babylon, not able to return. But what was happening was they were turning to prophets. There were prophets that were uh, raising up amongst the people of Israel. And they were telling them exactly what they wanted to hear. They were telling them things like, this won't last very long. Don't worry, God is going to get us out of this really quick. Don't bother setting your roots down here. The prophets were speaking all of the desires of the captives. They were basically preaching to their itching ears. Don't worry, it's going to be over soon. God was telling them, don't listen to those those prophets. He didn't send them. Because they were going to have to spend some time in Babylon. In fact, it was going to be 70 years. And if they didn't take root, if they didn't establish themselves and, and pray for the peace of the nation that they were living in, they were not going to prosper. That's exactly what God was telling them through Jeremiah. I can't imagine the kind of despair that people would feel if, as they were taken out of their nation and held captive in another nation. And I don't know about you, but I don't know if I would feel like praying for the prosperity of a nation that has completely overrun us and, and moved us. Can you imagine being forcibly taken out of your home and imprisoned somewhere else and then God comes along and says, hey, pray for these people. <laughs> it's very difficult to understand. It's, it's kind of hard to wrap our heads around. But what God is telling them is there is going to be redemption, but it's going to be after a time. These people in Israel have not uh, come across this. This is not an unjust punishment is what I'm trying to say. 
they had walked away from the Lord. They had uh, started worshiping other other gods. After many, many uh, attempts of God trying to appeal to them to come back to his heart, they just turned their back on him. And because of that, and because of, of them mixing with other nations, he, he sent Babylon because he wanted to recapture their heart. And he knew that he would have to drive that out of them. And so I imagine it it grieved his heart greatly to take his people and put them in a place where they may have to suffer. But here's what he's telling them. You don't have to suffer while you're there. Pray for the nation that you're captive in. Because as they prosper, you will prosper. It seems like an odd thing, but even in the midst of that, God doesn't want them to suffer. And he says, after a time, I'm going to send a spirit of prayer upon you. And that when you seek me, I will be found by you. He says, you will call on me and come to me and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you search with me. Search for me with all your heart. Unfortunately for Israel, it took a Babylonian captivity for their hearts to be broken again to where they needed to seek him with all their heart. Who knows, maybe we're in a situation in our own country where we need to refocus. Maybe the church needed to be put on pause for a while because we need to refocus because our hearts weren't set in focusing on the Lord like we should. I don't know. God uses times of exile to refocus people. And God was using this time for his people in Babylon to refocus them on their dependence upon him. which made me beg the question, could he be doing the same to our own nation, our own world, even yet today? Even as we go through a contentious political season, even as we realize that our democracy is not as stable as we think it is, and that it's not as sure a thing as we thought it might be. Which, again, asks us, we, again, we find ourselves asking, like much like last week, what then are we to do? Well, in light of the, the sermon, we need to pursue peace. Which means we need to follow the teachings that Jeremiah gave to the people. Pray for the nation that, that you feel captive in. I, I can go back and, and say, you know, there, there are people now that feel like the election was stolen. They're unhappy. There are people that felt that way four years ago. There's people that felt that way when Teddy Roosevelt was put in the office. There's throughout our nation's time. Look at the Civil War. There's been times when we've been greatly divided in the country. And in the darkest times of our nation, it's resulted in wars, assassination attempts, riots, and violence. That's not what God wants. God wants us to pray for the nation that we are in. Whether we feel like we are in amongst the exiles or those who have been liberated by the new balance of power. But we need to pursue peace with one another within this country. Well, like I said, the nation that is divided will not stand. There's another place we can look for strength and, and assurance. It comes from the book of Hebrews, chapter 12, verses 12 through 15. I believe these few short verses really speak to us today. They say, Therefore, strengthen the hands that are weak and the knees that are feeble, and make straight paths for your feet, so that the limb which is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. Here's the most important part for us. Pursue peace with all men and the sanctification, sanctification without which no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one comes short of the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it may be, be defiled. If we take those words and apply them to where our nation is today, we need to find the hands that are weak and the knees that are feeble and strengthen them. We need to make straight paths for our feet so that those who feel lame and out of sorts can be can be healed. Because if we don't pursue peace with all men, 
just like that scripture says, the sanctification cannot come. We don't pursue peace. If all we do is continue to go down this path that we're going down where we seek vengeance, we seek retribution, or want to inflict violence upon those who don't agree with us, there's no way we can be sanctified before the Lord. Instead, we should be pursuing that peace so that, as it says, so that no one comes short of the grace of God. That no root of bitterness would spring up and cause trouble. Because it will defile. We saw that a few weeks ago. There was so much bitterness with a small group of people that they overran our nation's capital. And you heard it said through the media, even though it might have <laughs> sounded a little idolatrous to say it. They said our great temple has been defiled. Maybe we do need to be shook up a little bit to understand that no matter who's in charge, there's always going to be a large group of people that are very unhappy. And instead of trying to write laws and write ways of keeping them out and oppressing them down and pushing them out and not giving them a voice, we need to figure out how to pursue peace with one another especially when we have contentious disagreements. You see, in, the, in these contentious times, we have to, we can't just write each other off. We have to acknowledge that when the balance of power changes, there are going to be those who are hurt, those who mistrust, and those who feel real pain. We have to acknowledge it and give space for those who feel exiled, whether it's their party that's not in control or maybe it's a lifestyle that they've chosen. God still wants us to pursue peace with one another. We need to be continually praying for the peace of our nation, whether we're on the side that feels exiled or the side that feels liberated, whether our side's in charge or not. We have to have peace and unity in our nation. I don't know about you, but I don't want to live in a nation that's divided against itself. And right now, it's about as divided as it possibly can be. Well, I know we're not in a civil war, but if you look at our nation's government, everything seems to be about 50-50 or 51-49. That means when one half sets down the rules, the other half isn't going to be happy. Amongst all this, we have to pursue peace, brothers and sisters. We have to seek peace with all men. It, it, it comes down to not just our country. It comes down to the soul of our nation. It comes down to the life and soul of our church comes down to the soul of each and every one of us. We have to make a choice. Are we going to go off into our corners and be angry and just wait for our opportunity to tear each other down? Or are we going to pursue peace with one another? As difficult as it may be, are we going to pray for the nation that may not look like the nation that we wanted to live in. This kind of peace has gotten to the point where it's infiltrated the church and divided the church in so many ways and so many issues too. So maybe it's no wonder that our nation is suffering because the church seems to be suffering. Because instead of pursuing peace with one another, we just divide and split and or the color of the carpet, or jello salad, <laughs> or just because we just don't like that person across across the aisle, brothers and sisters. When we abandon pursuing peace, we have abandoned following God. Christ has called us. Christ came 
and showed us what the ultimate peacekeeper looks like, what the ultimate peacemaker looks like. He sacrificed his life for all of us. Maybe it's time that we start sacrificing our, side, our lives for each other. That we lay down our arms, lay down our guard, drop our guard for a minute and just try to see the other person for the human being, the beautiful creation God made them to be. Brothers and sisters, we are called to be peacemakers in the world. Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers for they will inherit the kingdom of God. We must pursue peace. We must pray for our nation. We must pray for our loved ones, the peace of the church, the unity of the church. We must even pray for those we call our enemies. Because the only way that any of this will change for the positive is if we pursue peace and not seek vengeance. My prayer is that each and every one of us will do this as we leave this place. I pray this in the blessed name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ.
these words of the benediction. Brothers and sisters, go from this place pursuing peace with your fellow human beings, seeking out those who you may have differences with, trying to sit down and have dialogue, pursuing peace and showing love and mercy and grace to one another. I pray that as we go from this place that the church would rise up once again and be the ultimate example of peace in this world. And it starts with each and every one of us. May it be so. May you go in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you. Thank you.